good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, today is the start of the second phase of our SBCT Summer Speaker Series uh, 2022, which we've also been referring to in terms of the concepts and discussions to highlight the CTE for all students and each student. Uh, my name is Rodrigo Lopez, and I am the Director of B20 Initiatives at NIU, but I'm also a member of the NIU Illinois CT Project team. Um, so as I've said, today is our first educator panel, which we will be focusing on the conversations of family and community engagement and post-secondary placement. Um, what I'm going to do here in a little bit before I go ahead and uh, do a few acknowledgements is I'm going to start to drop in the sign-in form. So if you please wouldn't mind signing in, we do want to be able to go ahead and track participation. Um, and it's also helpful for us to make sure that we know who's here and, you know, that way we can continue to build relationships and learn from you moving forward. Um, with that being said, I did want to just say that, um, you know, we have members from our team here, as I said, uh, Mr. Ben Owen, who is going to be leading um, the conversations and the discussion with our panelists, um, but we also will have uh, Mr. Bill uh, Rose from our team, and um, give me just a second, is there a few more people coming in? Um, and um, from our ISBE team, our colleagues, uh, sorry, our colleagues at ISBE, we have uh, Heather Lucan, and so at this time, I'm going to ask if Heather can just say a few words on behalf of Bisbee. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Very, very glad to be here this morning with you and just have a listen um, to the discussion today. Uh, and we're also very, very excited to have these summer uh, speaker series. We think these are, are fantastic ways to connect and, and really promote and explore all aspects of CTE. So welcome to everyone, and I hope you enjoy the session. Thank you, Heather. So I have just dropped in the sign-in form. If you, again, if you wouldn't mind, please taking a, a, a quick second to fill that out. Um, and with that being said, I am going to go ahead and turn it over to Ben Owen so he can go ahead and introduce himself and get started with the panel. Ben? All right, thank you, Rodrigo. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing if you wanna take over the slide deck. So um, good morning, everyone. We're excited to have you here. Uh, as Rod Rodrigo mentioned, my name is Ben Owen, and I am a CTE educator on the NIU Illinois CTE project team, um, collaborating with ISBE on that project across the state. Um, we're excited to kind of kick off today with this educator panel um, and as a follow up to the summer speaker series, as Rodrigo had mentioned. So um, just a little bit of background information for you guys on um, what that looked like and kind of what today's uh, panel will kind of entail. So um, as Rodrigo mentioned, as part of the Career Connected Illinois um, efforts in the state to ensure that we have high quality CTE in the classrooms, that summer speaker series really focused on those three areas. We're going to, as a follow-up, dive a little bit deeper today um, into some discussion around um, our family and community engagement in post-secondary placement topic with uh, a couple panelists and how this will be designed is to have those individuals um, kind of in-depth provide responses to, to some questions that we're gonna ask them. As we go throughout, um, if there's any questions from the audience, please feel free to include those in the chat and we will do our best to incorporate that in as we go throughout. Um, but before we kind of jump in, um, I wanted to provide a background of the, the keynote that this is a follow-up to. So um, in June, we had uh, Dr. Ayana Brown from Elmhurst University and Thought Spectrum who uh, presented a keynote presentation on this topic. Um, and just kind of a quick overview of what that entailed um, was really focusing on a few different points. There was um, a lot of discussion and um, kind of navigating, understanding the learner's journey and how that impacts individuals and some different frameworks that have had a historical impact to really get to the bulk of what the meaning was and how it, how it ties to this topic in our CTE classrooms, focusing on who is the learner and having a need to understand who our learners are and how that impacts the demands for those learners in CTE classrooms, how we engage 21st century learners, and then ultimately coming to kind of the conclusion of the, the importance of having a commitment to learner as educators. And that really boiled down to dismantling stereotypes about individuals and their journey, um, making sure that we're engaging them as academic thinkers, and then obviously creating connectedness, which really goes to that relationship forming and um, working with uh, community. 
So that's a little bit of background on the keynote that took place. So at this time, um, we have two panelists who are going to be participating today, and I would like to ask them to introduce themselves. So if we could, could we have um, Joe and Karen both take a, an opportunity just to introduce yourselves briefly, if you could share um, your name, your school or district that you work in, your current position in uh, one aspect of CTE or college and career readiness that um, you love the work that you do in. All right, do you want me to start then? Sure. Okay, I'm trying to remember all your questions. Wow, that's a lot. I'm still in summer mode. That's okay. Um, <laughs> so we're just looking for name, your okay. position in district, and then one thing that you enjoy about uh, CTD okay. work that you might be involved with. All right. Hello, my name is Karen Simmons. I'm the Director of Student Services for the Genoa Kingston School District. So we are located um, near DeKalb, near NIU, about 20 minutes or so. Um, I guess north and wait, no, south. I don't know my directions. Anyway, we're about 20 minutes away from DeKalb. And um, we are, um, you know, my role is um, I have, we're a small district, um, just, you know, under 2,000 students. So I have a lot of different hats that I wear in a smaller district and trying to help our high school to navigate um, the college and career readiness is one of those hats. And I think that one of the things that I like about it is, um, or that I enjoy about the work is that I feel like it's very proactive work. It's the kind of work that you want to do as an educator, as opposed to solving problems. And um, I'm really excited about the possibilities that it um, has for our students, but really need to dig deeper into making those connections happen. Thank you, Karen. And hi all, I'm Joe Siskowski. I'm the director of CT Pathways and College and Career Readiness for Community Unit School District 300 in Algonquin, Illinois. Um, we are a very large district, so we're on the opposite side. Um, we go between the fifth and sixth largest uh, school district in Illinois, um, have about 21 schools and about, I believe, 26,000 students. <laughs> I mainly work with the middle school through high school CT programs, as well as um, we have a number of pathway programs, and then I get to oversee the dual credit programs with Elgin Community College. Um, one of the pieces I love about CT is I feel like in the past decade, a lot of things have changed, and the concept of find yourself in college is uh, very expensive nowadays to do, so um, I love that uh, we're working to help students determine what their post-secondary life is going to look like so that they can um, have a better, uh, I love Maine Township's return on investment concept, that they have a better return on investment overall in their life and don't rack up the debt if it's not necessary. So, All right. Thank you, Jill. Um, for those of you who are just joining, um, welcome. We just introduced our panelists, Joe and Karen, and we will be starting the panel discussion here shortly. Um, if you have not had a chance to, please jump, jump over to the chat and introduce yourself if you haven't had a chance to do that. Um, and also, Rodrigo has dropped in the sign-in form. Uh, if, if you could sign in if you haven't, and Rod Rodrigo will be adding that again as we move forward. So please make sure that you're able to do those things in the chat also. Um, so before we transition over here to really start the panel discussion, I um, just want to remind everyone that this is going to be fairly free flowing in terms of our discussion with our panelists. We do have a series of questions that we'll ask, but there will be some follow up questions at times from myself or some of my uh, colleagues over at NIU. Um, we do encourage you if you have questions or things that come up or input also to utilize that chat and we'll try our best to incorporate that as we go throughout the panel discussion also. So with that being said, um, we will go ahead and we will jump into the questions. So the first question we have, Joe and Karen, is how does your school district define the word post-secondary and how do students and families think you define the word post-secondary? Take a second to process and then either one can jump in. Okay, I can uh, jump in. I feel like for District 300, um, we're trying to design around a very broad um, definition of post-secondary. Um, 
with that concept of having multiple exit points within different career clusters or pathways um, so our students can excel or, or jump into employment whenever they feel it's best suited for them. Um, so that's why we're trying to design um, all of our pathways and CT programs around that concept of having um, a certification embedded, dual credit embedded, um, along with um, the work-based learning experiences to show them um, what the different options are within that pathway and <laughs> educate the family on uh, what the post-secondary options are re or required for that pathway as well. Um, uh, hopefully a lot of you have seen the model programs of study or model pathways um, that have been published by, I believe, Ed Systems that has the upper right quadrant that shows um, what the different career options are and then what the post-secondary sort of requirements are. Um, and just, again, continuing to educate families on <clears throat> that there's a wide range of these exit points and, and students can navigate that um, throughout their post-secondary life as needed. As far as what, how families define it, I think we're still um, working with families on the under, understanding or concept that college is this four-year bachelor type of experience and educating on that there's a lot more options nowadays and you can piece things together you can go to community college and then a four-year bachelor's there's not this end point um, type of concept um, but we're still working with our community on on what that looks like in many cases hey joe um thank you for that um really good response and a follow-up question for you in terms of the interaction with the families and kind of what they may view it as. Um, so obviously it seems like your district has a pretty defined goal of what you want to accomplish. In terms of trying to bring along the family and community, um, what are what are some strategies maybe you use or what do communications look like and have you seen any benefit from those specifically? Like when you talk about educating um, the families, can you just discuss what that might look like a little bit? Um, a lot of that's in the earlier stages of sort of development. Um, we've done a lot, of course, with COVID with virtual sessions, and I think we will continue to go that route. Um, but I think there is a need to doing some in-person at the different buildings um, in the near future as we're allowed to. Um, <clears throat> I think sometimes there's a disconnect. There's advantages to virtual where families that maybe can't attend or are almost like squeezing in the meeting, um, based on their family schedule are able to attend, um, but there's a stronger personal connection. Um, we're also trying to um, work on social media um, with our communications department and ensure that um, uh, communication is going out that way too. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, um, you know, some of the same things from a smaller district perspective. Um, I think, though, that in our area, I think that a lot of the focus and a lot of the families, particularly in students, still view post-secondary as going to college, whether that be a four-year institution, whether that be a community college, I feel like they really feel like that is the next step. That's the, and we've been trying um, to, you know, do much of what Joe talks about with, um, you know, educating the parents. And I think for us that education comes through um, the school counselors, having their, um, their individual meetings with their students. It comes from having the school counselors do um, in-class um, kinds of um, discussions. Um, and let's say, for example, junior year, everybody takes U.S. history is a requirement, so maybe the school counselors will go into all of the um, U.S. history classes and talk to them about, you know, particular targeted topics. We do the same thing all four years, you know, using like English 9 or, you know, whatever required courses are. So education comes in that way. Education comes in the individual meetings. Education comes in some different parent nights which, you know, sometimes aren't well attended, right? Um, you know, so we, we're always looking for better ways to work with our families and to educate our families and to educate our students um, as well. This past year, we did try to do a um, more intentional um, way of guiding our course book 
for our high school to where, you know, we tried to divide it into some of those career clusters um, and, you know, career areas, looking at those categories and saying, well, this group of classes together might look you know, at possible careers in this. And if you did want to do this, this might be some education or some job experiences. Um, we're also trying to build our dual credit. But it's a little bit more challenging, um, I think, in a smaller district. Maybe not. Maybe it's the same challenges, right? But, um, you know, not many of our, not really any, except for one of our teachers is dual credit certified in-house. So we rely a lot on our community college to partner with us for some of those experiences for students. And again, being that we're in a small area, some of that comes with our students actually having to get themselves to our community college um, for those opportunities, which is 30 minutes away and it's, you know, not great roads in the winter. And so there's, you know, definitely challenges and barriers that are associated with that. Again, being that we're in a smaller community, community those work partnerships are also very challenging because we don't have a lot of industry and business in a small town. So, um, you know, I'm not trying to say that we're not working really hard. We definitely are. But um, I think that there are some just considerations that um, that really um, that come with a smaller area that, you know, makes it, a, you know, potentially a little bit more challenging, but maybe at the same time gives us some greater opportunities to be creative. Okay, great. Thank you, Karen. Um, follow up question there talking about the small community and some of the, ch the challenges that you're facing is um, as you're looking at providing and kind of continuing to grow those opportunities for students, um, what is the response or how, how is your district navigating kind of continuing to educate families and to kind of let them know about the options, not just being college, but having multiple routes coming out of that? Um, I mean, it's a work in progress. You know, I think that each, um, each year, um, it seems to get, um, you know, more, um, I guess, widely accepted, but, you know, it's, it's still a work in progress, I would just say. Okay, thank you. All right, we will go ahead and move on to our second question, which is going to be, um, a lot of different components here. So obviously we know that there are um, multiple individuals who are going to be in, involved in or need to be engaged in our discussions on post-secondary um, in the CTE realm or in any realm for that matter, but really focusing on to start, um, how does your school engage um, parents in the post-secondary conversation? And then as you answer that, if you want to think about some of those other stakeholders who might be involved, that's kind of where the question will transition to. So um, thinking about like school counselors, which I know, Karen, you had already mentioned kind of how your um, school counselors are involved in that process. Um, your teacher, classroom teachers, CTE directors, if you have those and administrators. So just think about your stakeholders. We can start with parents and then kind of progress to the discussion from there. But how do you how do we engage those different stakeholders in the conversation of post-secondary in, in your districts? Well, Joe, I, get, I can go first this time since you took the last question first. Maybe we can kind of tag team the order there. Um, I would say that for us, um, we kind of start all of those conversations um, in our middle school. One of our um, our encore rotations that our students go through is a as a career readiness um, encore rotation. And for our district, what that looks like is they have about two six week classes in sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade that focus on um, careers. And um, they work on the you know taking the surveys and looking at um, you know, what they might be interested in. And, you know, then they get the opportunity to um, try to, you know, research a, a few different careers and look at, you know, what education is required, what out, you know, what, um, you know, what kind of skills are required and that kind of thing. We, um, at the middle school, they have some guest speakers come in and do some, you know, more, um, you know, career discussion, like I am a whatever, and, and, you know, this is what my path was, and, you know, the students have the chance to answer questions, and then um, they also um, get the opportunity to um, mock interview for a few different jobs. We have a few local businesses come in and, and do some of that. 
that sort of leads to then the school counselors will come and they'll talk about, you know, for, particularly for the eighth graders, you know, what options are available for high school as they start to think about, you know, signing up or asking um, for particular classes. And then um, in conjunction with that, it comes around the time of the ninth grade parent orientation where the parents learn about the different career paths. Because again, like I said, our, our course book now is kind of set up um, in the way that it, it goes through those different career um, pathways. So um, they'll talk a little bit about the school counselors, the different options for you know freshmen. And that kind of is that, I guess, entry point for parents to be involved. Um, could we do a better job? Sure, probably. A giant setting like that with all incoming, you know, ninth graders is probably not, you know, the, the best and, and maybe the only way to do it, but that's, I guess, the entry point. Then the students take home their course um, options, um, both electronically and in a paper format, and that allows the parents and the students the opportunity to kind of look at options together, think about it, um, make their selections, and um, it just kind of grows from there. Then each year the school counselors do a fall, you know, kind of a, um, a career night where they talk about, you know, a little bit more in depth about the different opportunities and things. And then, like I said, the individual meetings, but I'll, I'll be honest, I, I think that, um, you know, we could do a better job of reaching out to the parents and maybe a smaller venue versus the giant, um, you know, career night, the giant orientation night. Um, and certainly that happens when students request it, like if a student is wondering about something, then the, and let's call mom or dad, but maybe a more intentional way of doing some small groups or, or things like that might be um, beneficial as we, move, um, as we move forward. And then kind of, as you know, once you kind of set your path, this is what I think I wanna do, then a lot of the elective courses that you take and so forth kind of fall in place after that, with obviously the opportunity to um, change gears if you, if you so choose. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, and I, we're small enough that the teachers support this and, you know, all of that as well. I think that one of the challenges, though, is that, um, you know, we've gotten a little bit of pushback from our families about trying to um, pinpoint students when they're so young um, into a particular, you know, area and that they, you know, high school is all about those opportunities and finding your passions and, you know, that kind of thing. So I think we also have to be mindful and balance that. So we try really hard to set our students up um, to counsel them with, you know, the broadest opportunities that would gate them to what they want to do, but at the same time, not pigeonholing them into something that they may change their mind about. Great, Karen. Thank you. Okay, I can uh, jump in. Um, we, for the first time next, this coming school year, will be running a Skills for Success curriculum at our elementary schools. It's a K-5 curriculum. Um, a lot of it's got to do with executive functioning skills, development and stuff, but they are going to be dabbling a little bit with <clears throat> um, like that college and career exploration components at a very foundational level. Um, the ideas there are like dress up as a uh, and um, community, um, uh, losing the word, <laughs> um, community role, um, that type of thing, and, and maybe briefly to discuss it. Um, but they're in the middle of still working on finalizing some of the curriculum with that. Um, our middle school does have a college and career readiness rotation course in addition to um, a project-based learning, innovative, tech, innovative technology, um, where they get to dabble in different projects related to different uh, career pathways we have. Um, and then I mentioned that our high schools also have um, some pathways in addition to our CT programs of study. Um, one of the transitions we're making with the current pathway programs is each building has <coughs> historically housed a pathway program um, that isn't replicated at the other high schools uh, out of our three. Um, we're sort of going to be backtracking when possible with some of this um, as we roll out the college and career pathway endorsements and when possible um, expanding um, these college and career pathway endorsements at multiple buildings, um, mainly because we're not seeing a large interest of students um, willing to leave their base school to go attend full-time another school to um, 
<clears throat> participate in that program. Um, it also has to do with that concept of multiple entry points too. I believe Karen mentioned about having some opportunities where students can sort of try things and leave and go in different career pathways so they can explore in high school. And that makes it difficult when they've transferred to a different school. There's IHSA um, uh, uh, issues if they do withdraw and they go back to their home school, to their base school. Um, so we're trying to eliminate some of that as much as possible um, and provide as many opportunities across all the buildings so that all students can have so that equitable opportunity there. Um, we did last spring run for the first time a Northern Kane County um, job and career fair um, at one of our high schools at Dundee Crown High School in the afternoon. It was mainly targeted towards um, juniors and graduating seniors. Um, it ranged from everything from summer employment opportunities in the community um, to just the employers there talking about their, their, uh, their career areas. We are looking forward to potentially building that down the road and connecting it with some of our curriculum fairs um, to have this sort of hybrid post-secondary and career exploration fair and connecting the curriculum to it. Um, <clears throat> as far as um, sort of those other stakeholders involved, we're in the process of reviewing. Currently, we, we use Naviance. Um, and we have a PACE framework that was approved and developed prior to COVID. Um, everything sort of got halted, of course, with COVID. Um, so this year, we're really looking forward to diving deep into that PACE framework. And um, we, we have approved all the different um, objectives and stuff by grade level that we want to meet. But it stopped at the point of the, the how are those all addressed. And we want to start creating that library of um, what is it, um, district-wide approaches to addressing some of those um, initiatives, as well as what are some building specific and then sharing those across buildings so they can all um, uh, pull pieces that they like and embed it as appropriate um, for their building. <clears throat> and that committee is gonna involve counselors, teachers, admin, both district and building level um, in that work. Um, that team will also then again be reviewing other college and career readiness platforms so that we can sort of strategically um, <clears throat> ensure that some of this is happening for students and monitor data of completion because we do see this as a potential um, almost like an MTSS for college and career readiness. So when students aren't identifying a career cluster of interest or are having concerns that that sort of can level them up to this tier two level and we maybe can be more intentional in exposing them to different careers. While a student that's very focused, um, <clears throat> we then can provide them with <clears throat> more in-depth experiences that we can offer through work-based learning opportunities or our classes. So um, that's sort of a quick summary of where District 300 is at. Great, thank you, Joe. Um, so obviously, as you guys were talking to very different districts in terms of size, but some similarities in what was mentioned there. A um, okay. couple of things that stood out to me, we're just talking about the flexibility and providing uh, options for students to explore and see what those um, opportunities might be post-secondary. Um, and then something else I, I took a note on as you guys were talking here, because I found it interesting that you both kind of focused on this was incorporating the, the career exploration and starting at the elementary and middle school level, um, which I think is great to hear. Um, I was just wondering in terms of that, if one or if both of you could kind of share um, maybe the benefits that you've seen of having that introduced at the elementary or middle school or um, some tips or strategies for districts who maybe aren't there yet, but are looking to go that route to help continue to grow their program and enhance at the, the high school level. Well, I mean, we don't have anything at the elementary level at this time. So actually, Joe, I'd um, love it if you would put in the chat what the um, curriculum is that your elementary um, students are going to be exposed to. Um, that would be really um, interesting, I think. Um, as far as our middle school, um, I just think it helps to, you know, it, we also have a very strong um, in our rotation in middle school um, community service 
um, rotation that our students do. And I feel like that all kind of ties together, gets the students more um, knowledgeable about what um, service opportunities there are within our community. It gets them more keyed into what businesses and industries are available in our community. It gets them more aware of what possible um, career ideas are out there for them. So I do definitely think that the focus of the middle school has been very beneficial and it's also helped then our students as they go up into high school with making more intentional um, choices for um, courses that they want to take as electives and possible pathways that they want to explore um, earlier um, because, um, you know, at least exploration wise. So um, yeah, that's what I... And for us, um, we're still like living through that curriculum development process. We have, uh, I believe, six different sort of learning objectives that they're targeting throughout the year, and the team's still working through a lot of that. But I'm willing to meet with anyone interested in talking more detail about it. Um, long term, we we're still determining how that's going to fit into so that pace framework. We haven't extended it down to the elementary level, and that's why I got sort of pulled into the involvement and the development of that, um, those courses. Um, for the middle school, the college and career readiness course um, has been really helpful to give sort of that um, opportunity for students to explore. They did some Naviance work with interest surveys and um, uh, different di variety of surveys to help guide them to some uh, planning for high school and post-secondary. Um, we are needing to evaluate sort of our project-based learning and innovative technology courses because those are supposed to be where they get a decent variety of um, like many projects to explore these different career areas. Um, I would say we're not addressing all of the CT areas. It gets sort of difficult, um, like VAX isn't addressed heavily in those, those programs. Um, it's more of the tech multimedia um, programming type of stuff, STEM related things. Um, so that is sort of long-term, how do we address sort of those other facts and business related um, pathways in those uh, courses, so. Okay, great, thank you. We will go ahead and transition on to the, the next question, which is uh, how does CTE fit in, into your school district's definition or outreach to parents? So specifically looking at that CTE component in outreach to parents. I think that's where we were doing a lot of work last year to sort of backtrack on that definition of CTE versus pathways. Um, we had, again, I, these programs of study, culinary, auto, um, in many cases, very high functioning programs. Um, they already had certifications built in. Sometimes they even had some articulated dual credit built in, um, but then they were recognized as the CTE programs to study and not necessarily pathway programs because they were offered at all three buildings. While the previous definition of pathways were these unique programs at each high school. And I think that's what we're starting to try to backtrack on and, and unpack into the community that these CTE programs of study are still um, very high functioning, valuable pathway programs. Um, and I think that's why that transition to the college and career pathway endorsements across the board um, are gonna be helpful, I think, in that communication with families, um, because I, some of the ones we're gonna apply for, hopefully 23, 24, are our CTE programs of studies that are offered at all three buildings, because in some cases, they're the furthest along. Um, so I. That's where we're having to just clarify that definitions with families and and continue to promote that. Um, uh, there are some great CT programs of study, but that also includes that pathway concept. And they're sort of one of the same in many cases, so. Joe, going with that, and this is gonna kind of get into some of the questions we're gonna hit here in a minute, but as you're kind of navigating that, um, are, are you are you struggling to get like effective communication with with families and understand the difference in what options are or um, I guess what what has the response been to kind of that altered communication that you guys have started? Um, so far we've presented to our parent advisory councils um, 
there's uh, two or three different councils we presented to. So far, they've all understood, it seems like, the direction we're heading and are highly supportive of the direction that we're heading with it. Um, in general, we, I still answer a lot of questions with families about what is the difference between pathways and CTE and, and gen eds. Like, I think there's still some confusion with all that. Um, but I th again, I think with the rollout of the college and career pathways endorsements as we get approved, that that will provide a much clearer um, definition of what is the difference of a college and career pathway endorsement versus a CT program of study down the road. Okay, great. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, so for us, I guess, same, but not the same. So I would agree that I think our families um, view CTE, at least in our district, as something separate. And again, small district, we don't even have any, very many in-house CTE. We have a co-op um, with uh, several other districts in our area where our students go out of you know, out of the public high school for their CTE. So um, unfortunately, I think that it's kind of been viewed um, through the years as a non, you know, college or non, you know, alternative to, um, well, if you're not gonna go to college, consider taking these CTE classes. And that's not necessarily true at all. Um, we all know that um, you know, getting a degree in, you know, multimedia, um, you know, is, is just as important as getting a certificate. So um, as one example, so I think just um, because a lot of our families are generational, right? So mom went to our high school, dad went to our high school, they took CTE classes back in the day. Now, maybe the CTE um, classes are a little bit different now than they were back then, but I think there's still that like generational um, thought process about it. So as we're starting to build career pathways, and again, are really, we're not nearly as far as D300, we're just, you know, trying to do the intentional um, course guide, um, walk, you know, crosswalk, so to speak. Um, so, you know, again, in our, as we're um, endorsing that, as we're articulating it, as we're sharing it at parent meetings and, um, you know, the board level and with students, um, hopefully it'll all come together, um, but we do have, a, I feel like, a little bit of an uphill battle with CTE having been something that was so ingrained in, in the district for so many years um, and kind of making sure that we intentionally, um, you know, rebrand re it, if you will, to where it, it fits in with those career pathways because it's going to be a hugely important um, component. Thank you, Karen. I think that um, statement you made about the branding and the marketing of um, what we're offering is extremely beneficial and extremely important. So thank you for that. Um, going to kind of continue on to the next question here, and this is going to be kind of a progression of the, the discussion we've been having so far about that parental engagement. So the next question is, is how is your school or district structured to lead that parent engagement in uh, the activities and initiatives that um, the district is rolling out. Is it my turn to go first, Joe, or your turn? I can't remember. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, I think for 300, and it's sort of what Karen has shared with the sizes of the district, like fortunately 300 has a lot, is a much bigger district and has a lot more resources and this is something I've heard with um, some of the other smaller districts we have worked with. Um, we have an like, entire communications department that's supporting this work and that branding piece you just talked about. So um, there's some advantages that we fortunately have that some others I think don't always have. Um, so that's been really helpful with um, moving forward. Um, and it's taken off some load off of my plate. I think some other directors are administrators and districts have to sort of lead on their own. Um, we have a variety of a well-structured sort of uh, variety of uh, parent committees and, and councils and advisory groups and that we can get to and, and talk to different um, stakeholders, um, different representatives. Um, so that's also been an advantage. Um, 
there was another piece I was thinking of mentioning and I dropped it. So I'll let Karen take it and I'll try to think uh, what that was. Thanks, Joe. So, you know, a lot of our parent communication is done via surveys that we send out to parents. You know, how do you feel that this is going and that is going? And, you know, that's, you know, you don't necessarily know. Um, it's good information. Um, I don't know about um, parent committees. Honestly, that's a little bit too deep in the weeds for me with, you know, my role at the district level. I'm guessing that there are some parent committees that, that go on. But, you know, the other very real thing about a small district is that, that you know, I, that I just feel like necessary to share is, you know, doing more parent engagement activities, which would typically be after school or in the evenings when you're a small district, you know, you're, you're counting on those same individuals to run those things over and over again. And, um, you know, you always also have to, you know, balance that, you know, protection of your staff so that they don't get overburdened or, you know, feel um, overtaxed on, you know, their role. So I think, you know, being creative about some of how that might work moving forward would be important. Um, and it's not as simple as just saying, well, we would have somebody else run it. Because in a smaller community, those parents and community members know those people, right? And they feel comfortable with them. So we would want to use, you know, those people to help us with some of those activities, but um, I think we just need to think about how we can, you know, especially with like a school counselor, flex some of their time so that they, you know, could in fact be available for some of those um, smaller group activities I talked about previously, because I think that's really where you're going to get your, um, you know, your best um, involvement is, you know, offering, you know, a large group and a virtual session and a small group session, you know, just trying to hit it all the different elements. Great. Thank you, Karen. Um, I do have a follow-up question, not to put you on the spot, but we'll put you on the spot a little bit. Um, so Joe had mentioned the resource difference between a large district and a small district, and then you were even navigating, talking about like the human resource elements um, in this being in a smaller district. Do you, and talking about using that creativity, do you have any um, specific recommendations or things that you would recommend to individuals who might be in the same situation with those limited resources um, that would be helpful? If not, that's okay, because I kind of threw you on the spot, but. Well, do you mean in terms of like the parent engagement piece? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, like I said, I haven't done a very good job of it, right? This is like an area of growth for me too, but I would like to, um, to see about the possibility of flexing some of the school counselor's time um, to maybe, you know, not have to be at work on a particular afternoon or morning so that they could, you know, take a, an after school, you know, kind of offer some different time frames, right? Some parents might, you know, maybe offer a day session. Some parents might be able to manage that with their schedule. Maybe offer a late afternoon, a four to six kind of a time frame at some point, flexing a couple of hours of school counselor time maybe offering an evening opportunity for small group, again, flexing some of the school counselor time or using some of those parent conference times that you might already have built in your schedule. Um, or, you know, depending on the district, some districts have PLC time, maybe some school counselor time could be flexed in those ways. So just trying to look at the resources that you have and then try to, um, to target those resources to try to reach the most amount of parents at different times, recognizing that, you know, just because Thursday night at seven works for me, it may not work for a lot of our parents kind of thing. Great, thank you, Karen. And Ben, I remembered, I wanted to just briefly mention about like our course structure and sequencing and our program development and where we're heading with that. It has really, I feel like been a benefit to um, our families in that we have three very different sort of communities and high schools that we serve. Um, but we're not here to say it's college or not college. We're here to, again, go back to that multiple entry and exit point concept and that return on investment concept. So I feel like a very broad messaging and focusing the conversation back to the student and the families and through their experiences is has been and will continue to be really helpful um, because again, we're not 
telling students what they need to do. We're providing a ton of opportunities, which again, a larger district, we can have a lot of opportunities. Um, but we've also are experiencing some success regionally where we're partnering with some of our other high schools or districts in our 509 to um, sort of share programs um, across the districts when possible. So um, again, just huge opportunities that we're just trying to continue to grow. That's great. Thank you, Jill. All right, transitioning to our next question here. Um, can you talk a little bit about your parents' response to post-secondary in regards to successes and challenges that, challenges that you've experienced within your di district with parent response to post-secondary? I think it's this my is, turn, Karen. I was gonna say, it's been <laughs> touched on a little bit already, so feel free to yeah. elaborate or bring up some of those points again. Yeah, um, so I think we go, I go back to for 300, that concept of um, families are communicating that they're not always interested in leaving their base school despite which school they're at and leaving friends. Um, so trying to expand when t staffing's available, resources are available, classroom space at one of our high schools is very, very limited. So that's a, a challenge. Um, but when we can align everything together and run a program at a building, I think moving forward, that's what we're gonna do. Um, and our community has shared that that's something they want. Um, and as we continue to present and move forward with the College and Career Pathway endorsements, we've had really nothing but positive um, feedback from families mm -hmm. that this is the direction we need to go. We need to expose students to their opportunities and, and teach them what opportunities that are there and set them up for a wide range of post-secondary options. Great, thank you. So I would say that, um, you know, it's a, it's a work in progress, right? So I think that, you know, we struggle not necessarily with the pathways at different high schools, like um, Joe talked about, since we only have one high school, but some of our CTE programs that are off-site or even our um, partnership um, with Kishwaukee College um, preparation programs, like we have an engineering math and science academy and a pre-professional academy that we partner with our community college for. And even those experiences, um, some of the students don't want to miss, you know, out on being at the high school in order to take advantage of. So, um, you know, it's, it's an ongoing um, tap dance, if you will, or, or you know, articulation where you pro point out, you know, the, the benefits, the challenges to um, making those decisions to, um, you know, to go a, a particular direction with being out of the building for a portion of the day or not being out of the building for a portion of the day um, to try to help the, educate the families on um, making the best decisions. Um, it's only been about three years since we've had some on-site dual credit classes at our high school with um, that are taught by Kishwaukee College instructors where the students will get, you know, let's just say that basic English credit for the first um, beginning English and that kind of thing. And even getting some families to look at that as a, as a benefit um, is sometimes difficult because the students are like, well, I want to take Mr. Such and Such. My brother had him and he was such a great teacher and, you know, trying to really, you know, educate them about, yeah, but now you're not going to have to take, you know, English 100 when you go to college. And even if you're not sure, you'll have that out of the way if you ever do go. And, you know, so it's an ongoing. And I think the more years we have dual credit, the more years we have um, the um, communication um, channels as open as possible, the, the, the easier and the better it gets. Great, thank you. Um, so I know that both of your districts are doing great things also for students. Are there any successes that you guys would like to highlight, take an opportunity to highlight that's going well in your district in terms of the post-secondary or parent response to post-secondary that maybe hasn't been mentioned? Well, for us, um, you know, we had a really, really great partnership pre-pandemic with an industry, um, a business industry in our community that's actually, you know, thriving. And um, it would, they would take um, about two students each year, which doesn't sound like a lot, but for a smaller district, that's pretty good. And um, they would employ them during their senior year, um, during a portion of the day. So the students would go to school for a certain portion of the day, and then they would work and get paid a, you know, good wage um, and to learn. And then they would also 
um, send them after high school on to our community college for an associate's degree and then on to a four year for an engineering degree um, as long as they you know agreed to work for the company I think for just two or three years after they obtained that bachelor's degree so that was a really and that was even pre a little even a little bit pre pre you know all of the articulation about pathways so that was a, a really great um, experience and opportunity um, for our students unfortunately Unfortunately, it went away with the pandemic, and so hopefully that'll be something that we can build on um, and um, and further. I also feel like our it isn't necessarily the same thing, but our engineering, math, and science academy um, partnership with Kishwaukee College is really great because the students go on for engineering with like 36 college credit hours um, already. Um, with a lot of those courses that they need. They get their um, their calculus sequence out of the way, um, which is huge because calculus is taught in different ways depending on you know what type of a college you go to. There's um, the calculus for physics and then on. And so um, that was that's a huge benefit for a lot of our students. And they started a pre-professional realm for like pre-dentistry or pre-medicine, which has been very helpful to a lot of students. It's enabled a lot of our um, students to graduate from college, four-year college in less than four years. So, um, and I know that's you know obviously one of the goals of the whole state is to look at that kind of running start program down the road or as we speak. Great, thank you, Karen. Um, I feel like we've had a lot of successes um, and then there's a lot on the horizon that we're anticipating. Um, we applied for a lot of dual credit um, in alignment with the college and career pathway endorsements with ECC. So we're um, sort of in the final stages of um, watching um, what staff get approved and um, looking forward then to going back to HR and talking about who wasn't approved and how we can tackle that sort of moving forward. Um, we had a lot of discussions last year about strategically aligning our course requests to, to the College and Career Pathway endorsements with ECC to be very strategic in that. Um, we ran a summer camp uh, for our middle school students that was a very low cost week long summer camp last, last June at two of our high schools. We're looking forward to expanding that to our third high school. And then in the region, we'll be having discussions this fall about how we can continue to expand across those opportunities across the region as well as at ECC and partner with some of that work. Um, so it's it's sort of sporadic in our different successes that we've had, but I feel like it is slowly starting to all come together and align. Um, a significant goal for this year though is going to be um, increasing our community and industry partnerships and starting to pilot um, a variety of work-based learning experiences this coming spring and summer and next fall. Um, and I say a variety because we have an internship program that's already well-structured and functional. Um, but as we have learned from partnering with other uh, neighboring districts, that flexibility is key um, when we're trying to hit that 60 hours for the college and career pathway endorsements because we have students involved in AVID or BAND, um, variety of, of competing interest and if we want to see this be successful we need to have some flexibility in addition to our standard internship two-period block class um, to be able to accommodate more students so great thank you uh, joe I, I noticed there that you said that um you've had multiple successes and that it takes time um and i think that's important to note that a success is a success for our students and eventually it's going to take time and those are going to start aligning to the the larger goal um as we're looking to move in the direction of accomplishing these things so thank you for sharing that um at this time looking at the time here we're going to go ahead and transition and ask if there are any questions from anyone who's in attendance who want to uh, ask either Karen or Joe questions uh, in the panel. You can go ahead and put those in the chat and then we'll help navigate that if um, if you'd like. And once we call on your question, you can feel free to um, kind of unmute and ask that question if you'd like. So ben, I, ben, I had one that came through on a, a direct message if I can share, because I think it was really interesting. Absolutely. Um, it was a question about um, has 300 looked into offering any sort of virtual sessions? Um, have you had any luck with uh, virtual learning 
um, to balance that concept of staying at a base school. Um, in particular, with dual credit, that is something we have been exploring um, and we want to um, we look forward to offering that to our students this coming fall um, because for non lab based dual credit courses, um, particular for us right now, it's um, Psych 100. We only have one teacher approved at one building um, and it's a non lab based class. So we have been in discussions with the union about what it can look like to have a virtual section for the other two high schools. Um, and what we've just talked about with ECC is that's sort of a high impact type of class. It spans across sort of a few different um, pathway endorsements. Um, so we are exploring how we can potentially offer that. So now, of course, with the lab-based ones, that's gonna be a challenge. Um, we are still at early stages of navigating what that might look like. I know many districts allow students to travel from different buildings. Um, for like capstone purposes. Um, at the moment, I'm anticipating welding and manufacturing are gonna be our two programs that we probably do not expand and they will continue to live at Hampshire High School simply because of the resources and space involved in those programs. Great, thank you, Joe. It looks like we do have a question that came in um, from Michael asking, do either of the school districts have an associate's degree program? And if you do, how do you, how do you communicate those to students and families? Uh, District 300 does. We have our full-time accelerate program. Um, in addition to our CTE part-time and our Jed and, Jed and Gen Ed part-time courses, um, you for the full-time accelerate program, they can take that as a junior or senior. Um, of course, if they don't start until senior year, then um, they won't leave with their associates. Um, we have been communicating that the last few years through a um, collaborative video, uh, recorded video with ECC and us um, that has been posted and shared with families. Um, prior to COVID, they did have some in-person sessions and stuff. Again, I think we'll be visiting what that looks like. Um, we also have a, an assigned counselor at each high school who is responsible for being sort of the contact person at that building. Of course, all the counselors can speak to it, but the um, specific counselor that has this responsibility is sort of the expert. Um, so we encourage the families to start with their, their base counselor and then um, if they have questions, uh, reach out to a dual credit counselor at the high school and then to myself or the building associate principal of instruction if needed. Um, so we're excited. I think we're in the third year or so of offering this, third or fourth. Um, numbers are sort of stagnant. Um, we actually didn't fill all of our spots for next year. Um, we think there's a variety of reasons, um, uh, probably mainly pandemic related. Um, we do hear concerns at one of our buildings, and I think Karen mentioned it about transportation concerns because they do have to go to ECC for that. Um, as far as solving that problem, there's been some beginning conversations, but it is, it's a challenge between the three high schools we have. Um, one um, is sort of in a, a very sort of urban area that we can probably figure out some public transportation to or, um, but then another one of our high schools, Hampshire is in a per, fairly rural community and there's not gonna be that public transportation all the way to ECC. So um, we'll just continue to navigate that. Um, but we do graduate um, students um, the last two years, I believe with the associate's degree um, coming out of high school. We have not had that. Um, we don't have an articulated program at this point. It's something that we're, we're still working on. Um, you know, we've had a few meetings with our local high schools to try to see if, you know, we can increase um, dual credit opportunities by kind of pooling our resources together. Um, as I mentioned earlier with the Engineering Math and Science Academy, we do, the students are expected to provide their own transportation. So we know that that would probably still be the case um, for a, you know, dual certification program. So it's, it's something that we're always striving towards, but we're, we're not, we're not nearly as close to that. So. Great. Thank you. 
So just a reminder for you guys, I am dropping a link right now for the sign-in sheets into the chat. If you have not had an opportunity to do that, can you please make sure that you um, take just a moment to sign in to help us out? Um, in addition, if there are any additional questions, you can drop those in the chat so we can facilitate some discussion before we wrap up on those here. So any additional questions that anyone wants to ask? And if I can just share, I think Karen at one point mentioned like that they're not as far along as District 300 or something along those lines. And I've done a lot of um, research and partnering with uh, neighboring districts. And what I've come to realize is some districts are further ahead in some areas and some are further ahead in others. And as a whole, I don't think any of us are that far apart, especially with the support ISBE has had in the past two years with this work. Um, and just as a state, it feels like there's a lot of momentum moving forward. So I think all of our districts, no matter where we're at, can fairly quickly catch up and, and be right in the game with every other district um, in Illinois on this work. So excited to keep this moving forward. Joe, I think that's a, a very valid and very important point. So thank you for bringing that up. And the other thing to keep in mind as we consider where your, our district is currently at is each different has uh, different students and different needs. So just because you might not be mirroring what another district is, you might be um, doing so because you're trying to really focus on the needs of your students. And um, like Joe said, with the um, project work in the state and the support of ISBE, I think it'll be very easy for schools to continue to move in the right direction and ramp up from wherever they are in the process um, as we head into the next couple of years. Yeah, I agree. And I, you're right. I mean, we, you know, there are a lot of similar things that we both shared. Um, we might just have different um, ways of getting there. And I think for the audience, it's really nice because they can kind of see that complete difference between or you know the the how we're each incorporating the the elements and the tenants um in spite of our size great thank you guys for that well it does not look like we had any more questions come in so at this point i want to take an opportunity um one to thank everyone in attendance for taking part of your day to learn a little bit from our panelists but also to thank um both joe and karen for um, coming and sharing their um, thoughts, knowledge, and expertise um, to kind of help us all think about some of these things that are really important in our schools. So uh, thank you to you guys. And um, I can uh, stay on if anyone has questions or wants to speak individually. But other than that, that kind of wraps up our panel discussion for today. We do have some additional ones uh, coming up. Uh, focus on those other topics. So if you have interest in attending those, I would definitely encourage you to do that also. But thank you everyone for attending. And again, thank you to Joe and Karen for um, sharing your expertise and knowledge today.